Hello and welcome back. Today we examine confrontations during the Cold War in the continents of Asia and Latin America. We will first look at Asia, concentrating specifically on the expansion of communism in China, Korea, Vietnam, and Afghanistan, and the efforts to contain the expansion by capitalist nations led by the United States. We will then turn to Latin America and the emergence of local resistance to neo-colonialism, the alternative to empire that Europeans and the United States have long promoted in independent countries of that continent and which have made an appearance in Asia and Africa after decolonization. We'll start with the spread of communism to China. In 1949, Chinese communists under the leadership of Mao Zedong gained control of the large country after years of fighting U.S. supported nationalist elements. The creation of the People's Republic of China added another heavyweight to the communist side in the Cold War. Once in power, Mao launched a series of movements meant to turn China into a modern industrialized state that could compete with the other major global powers. The first of these movements was the Great Leap Forward, which established people's communes in the countryside and began the mass mobilization of people into collectives. Yet the leap didn't turn out to be that great. By the mid-1960s, China was still far from Mao's stated goals. He then instituted what came to be known as the Cultural Revolution, which aimed to enforce socialism in the country by removing capitalist, traditional, and cultural elements from Chinese society and to impose Maoist orthodoxy within the Communist Party. Millions of people were persecuted in the violent factional struggles that ensued across the country and suffered a wide range of abuses, including imprisonment, and the seizure of property. A large segment of the population was forcibly displaced, most notably the transfer of urban youth to rural regions. Cold War globalization continued in Asia as Chinese-supported North Korea invaded capitalist South Korea in 1950. U.S. military units were deployed to defend South Korea, leading to three years of vicious fighting that finally ended in 1953 with a ceasefire that left the Korean peninsula divided between North and South, Communist and Capitalist Korea. The division continues to this day. Incidentally, in the photograph on the right, you can see U.S. soldiers that fought in Korea. This was the first war in which black and white soldiers fought together. The U.S. Army had years earlier integrated its fighting units, ending ethnic segregation in the military. Unfortunately, the same would not happen in civilian life for more than a decade after the Korean War. Yet the Cold War raged on. In the 1960s, the U.S. involved itself in a very costly and tragic war in Vietnam. As with Korea 10 years earlier, the Vietnam War pitted communists in the North against capitalists in the South. Lasting until 1975, the war claimed the lives of over 1 million Vietnamese as well as 58,000 U.S. soldiers. Yet the heavy deployment of U.S. troops and materiel did not result in an American victory. After over a decade of fighting communist Viet Cong guerrilla fighters, the U.S. pulled out of Vietnam, leaving the communists to conquer the South. The Vietnam War heavily influenced U.S. society. It was the first war that was televised, and the violent images of the war that Americans saw on the nightly news turned much of the nation against the war and heavily influenced the government's decision to pull out. Popular discontent turned into mass protests across the country and eventually into an anti-war movement that was closely connected to the civil rights movement of the 1960s. The Soviet Union suffered its own Vietnam War starting in 1979 when it invaded neighboring Afghanistan. Officially, the Soviet troops in Afghanistan were there to support the communist-friendly government against the Afghan Mujahideen guerrilla movement. Yet, Cold War divisions influenced the conflict. The Mujahideen received unofficial military and financial support from a variety of countries, including the United States and its Cold War allies. With CIA-delivered modern weaponry, the Mujahideen succeeded in frustrating Soviet attempts to gain control of the whole country. After 10 years of engagement, the Soviet troops accepted defeat and withdrew from the conflict in 1989. We now turn to Latin America an area of the world decisively affected by Cold War confrontations. Although Latin American countries had largely avoided colonial domination during the 20th century, if you remember from the beginning of the course, most Latin American nations had gained their independence from Spain and Portugal in the early 1800s, they did suffer the economic and political domination of Europe and the United States 
The U.S. especially came to dominate its southern neighbors economically and politically by pressuring them, sometimes through military intervention, to accept the exploitation of their natural resources by American companies. Though this neo-colonialism did not regularly involve physical occupation, as the formal imperialism of Asia and Africa did, its exploitative nature nevertheless incited resistance from local populations. Reactions against neocolonialism emerged in different forms throughout Latin America. Today we're going to be looking at three specific models of resistance to neocolonialism in Argentina, Cuba, and Mexico. First, in Argentina, the populist Juan Perón rose to power by proposing strong Argentinian nationalism centered on anti-neocolonialist resistance. He was supported by the descamisados, or shirtless ones, a term used to describe the thousands of poor Argentinian peasants and workers. His popularity among the descamisados was aided in great part by the political activism of his wife, Evita Perón, who took an active role in supporting organizations for the poor and also became an active advocate for women's rights in Argentina. Perón's dependence on Evita was such that after her death from cancer in 1952, his popularity declined rapidly, leading in 1955 to his exit from government. Nevertheless, he would return again in the 1960s, and his anti-colonialist nationalism was a model many subsequent governments used, both in Argentina and around Latin America. Another model of resistance to neocolonialism was the Cuban Revolution of 1959. Nowhere was the Cold War context of the resistance to U.S. neocolonialism in Latin America more clear than in the Cuban Revolution. In 1959, a ragtag revolutionary army led by Fidel Castro and Ernesto the Che Guevara took control of Cuba from the U.S.-supported dictator Fulgencio Batista. Though Guevara was very much influenced by communist doctrine, Castro, the leader of the movement, was not necessarily keen on imposing a communist system in Cuba. However, Castro did seek to nationalize all companies in Cuba to put an end to exploitative neocolonialism. After the U.S. refused to accept this nationalization plan, Castro then turned to the Soviet Union for aid, keenly playing one Cold War superpower against the other. Once Castro's turn to communism became evident, the U.S. government authorized action aimed at undermining the fledgling revolutionary government in Cuba. This translated into a failed attempt in 1961 to invade Cuba by a CIA-trained force of Cuban exiles. The invasion, called the Bay of Pigs, in reference to the bay where the U.S.-supported Cubans landed, was a complete failure. The Cuban armed forces had been alerted of the impending invasion and were waiting for the attack. The nail in the coffin of the invasion was the last-minute decision by U.S. President John F. Kennedy to hold back the U.S. air support he had promised the Cuban exiles. After the defeat at the Bay of Pigs, the U.S. took a much more conservative approach to containment in Cuba. Yet Cold War frictions with Cuba continued through the following years. In fact, the closest the world came to nuclear war was during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. The Soviet Union had snuck missiles into Cuba, less than 100 miles from U.S. shores. The revolutionary government in Cuba, led by Fidel Castro, had agreed to the missile deployment in exchange for Soviet economic subsidies. When U.S. intelligence found out about the missiles, President John F. Kennedy ordered a blockade of the island nation and demanded that the Soviets remove the missiles already deployed. The Soviet premier, Nikita Khrushchev, refused to accept and ordered Soviet ships to continue supplying Cuban missile stations. For 13 days, the U.S. and Soviet Union were on the brink of a war that would have meant mutual destruction. Finally, however, the fear of all-out nuclear war convinced Khrushchev to back down. The Cuban missile bases were dismantled, and it seemed that the U.S. had emerged triumphant. However, what is often overlooked is that JFK had also agreed to dismantle U.S. missile stations in Turkey, close to the Soviet border. Both superpowers had recognized the irrationality of destroying each other. Better to continue struggling against each other in smaller, indirect conflicts than to not exist at all. After the Cuban crisis, U.S.-Soviet relations were characterized by what was known as detente, a softening of tensions that relied heavily on negotiations and agreements. Thanks in large part to this new approach to Cold War confrontation, Fidel Castro remained in power in Cuba for over 45 years. 
He has recently stepped down, but his brother Ramon has taken over for him, leading many to argue that Fidel is still the de facto ruler of Cuba. One thing is certain, however. Fidel has always incited passionate reactions from Latin Americans. He is revered by many for having stood up to the powerful United States. Others, though, see him as the incarnation of a red communist devil. One last example of anti-neocolonialist resistance in Latin America is the Zapatista movement in the Mexican region of Chiapas in the mid-1990s. During that decade, the adoption of neoliberalism by the Mexican federal government and its close connection with the United States after signing the NAFTA trade agreement in 1994 clashed with leftist political groups in Mexico, especially as the reforms began to have negative economic effects on poor farmers. This impoverishment became especially notable in the region of Chiapas. Although rich in resources, two-thirds of the Chiapas residents did not have sewage service, only a third had, le had electricity, and half did not have potable water. Over half of the schools offered education only to the third grade, and most dropped out by the end of the first grade. These grievances were taken up by a small band of leftist ideologues called the Zapatista Army of National Liberation led by a man called Subcomandante Marcos. You see him in the images here wearing the ski mask. They came to the world's attention when on January 1st, 1994, the day that the NAFTA treaty went into effect, they occupied and took over various towns in Chiapas. They read their proclamation of revolt to the world and then laid siege to a nearby military base, capturing weapons and releasing many prisoners from the jails. The guerrillas enjoyed brief success, but the uh, following days, the Mexican army forces counterattacked and fierce fighting broke out throughout Chiapas. A ceasefire was signed thereafter, and the Mexican army regained much of the territory claimed by the Zapatistas. But the movement remained entrenched in the mountains, where it continues to broadcast its opposition to the neocolonialist tendencies of the United States and Mexican governments. Perhaps the most interesting characteristic of a relatively small and contained Zapatista rebellion was that it caught the attention of the national and world press. In this, the Zapatistas took advantage of the then new internet to get the group's message out, putting the spotlight on indigenous issues in Mexico in general. This opened a new phase in world politics where the internet, or command of its audience at least, brought new weapons of resistance to even the smallest, most isolated parts of the global world. So that's it for today. Next week, we will examine the uh, end of the Cold War in 1991. We will consider the reasons for the U.S. or capitalist victory in this protracted conflict and the legacy in world politics left by its conclusion. Until then, have a good week.